I want to uh, introduce our first speaker. So, uh, Mickey Berardelli is the CEO of Kidbox. I met Mickey uh, first about 10 years ago when she was a VP of marketing at Ralph Lauren. Um, and it's just been an honor to watch her career grow. Um, she is now a force in retail. Um, in addition to being an industry expert and a marketing heavy, heavyweight with decades of experience, um, including uh, she rose to be the senior vice president of marketing at Ralph Lauren. Uh, she was the CMO at Tory Burch, the CMO and president of digital commerce at Chico's. And um, she's a super nice person to boot. Uh, so you don't find that combination very often. And um, this just happened yesterday. She is the youngest inductee uh, to the Sycamore High School Alumni Hall of Fame. Uh, so uh, I'll let her share a little bit more about that. So uh, Mickey joined Kidbox uh, as CEO about a year ago. Um, she's going to tell you all about it and the way she's approaching the business. So I'm thrilled to introduce Mickey as our opening keynote. with me. Good morning. Thank you. Scott and Alan and Veronica for your amazing support. Um, I wanted to be very thoughtful about how I spent our time together today because this is the more intimate forum. And um, yesterday I was looking through my presentation and I just put it down and I called Alan and he was stuck in traffic, which was awesome because he had time to talk. And I said, what do you want me to do? Oh, there you are, you moved. And he said, just tell your story. And I thought about it and I've been an audience member many times and I've always wondered, you know, when people just launch into their charts and their pie charts and bar charts and graphs and data, who are you? What's your story? So I agreed with Alan that I'm just gonna share my story. And Scott made me sound really old at first when he was talking about decades of experience. And then he made me sound really young when I'm the youngest inductee into my Sycamore High School distinguished alumni. So um, I think I'm old enough to share some wisdom and young enough to know that I still have a lot ahead of me. So I'm humbled and grateful to be here and thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to listen to me. Um, so my first slide, why do I have a leather jacket on this slide? This was the moment for me. This was late 1990s, the first time I shopped online. I think it was bluefly.com, uh, founded by a good friend of ours named Ken Seif. And I bought this leather jacket, and it arrived in my home. And I realized in that moment that the world was changing. And I became somewhat of an outcast, along with some of my good buddies talking about how this world was going to evolve and stores were not going to be as relevant in the future and something's happening digitally. And I, I realized that it was a moment. It was a spark in my spirit. It was a spark as a consumer, not as a professional, as a consumer that spirited and drove my career. So these are my boys. I'm a mom. I have two boys. That's Max. Um, 14, just turned 14 yesterday, and Vic, um, who's 11. And I force them to wear these t-shirts every single day. <laughs> They're like my walking billboards, because I'm a marketer at heart. No, I'm kidding, but I would if I could. Um, so a lot of people have asked me, why did I leave the big job to join a startup? Um, I've worked for many billion dollar companies. I've grown companies from 200 million to over a billion over the years. But what I realized about my career and at this stage of my life is that I was happiest in high growth environments. I love those double digit year over year increases. That's what gets me out of bed. That's what motivates me in terms of growth. I like moving things exponentially, not incrementally. And so that was a huge part of it. Um, but a bigger part was that I'm a builder, and I like knowing every single brick in my, in my house. So I have this amazing opportunity to join this company at its very inception and know every single piece about it. Many of us have inherited jobs with big responsibility, and you don't quite know why every brick has been laid. You don't know why every decision was the right decision at that point in time. 
And I thought it was going to be an amazing experience to understand that, own that, be a part of it, and be, be the builder, and be the one who can say, it was the right decision at that point in time. We're making a different decision today. I saw a huge business opportunity from a consumer perspective and the opportunity to build a world-class team and most importantly, to build the best company culture ever. I've walked into companies that had amazing culture and then grew very quickly and lost culture. I've walked into companies that have had a nuanced culture where it's difficult to figure out and there's no writing on the wall. And I've walked into companies that actually have writing on the wall, but nobody walks the walk. So I felt very passionate about joining a company as a leader and being laser focused on building an amazing company culture. And I will add, most importantly, with Kidbox, which I'll share in a moment, we have a social mission at our core. So for every box kept, we clothe a child in need through our relationship with Delivering Good, formerly known as KIDS Fashion Delivers. And at this stage in my career, it's table stakes. I need to have a bigger meaning, something, a bigger purpose. When I get out of bed and I come to work, I have to be doing something other than making money for myself and for others. I need to be doing something helpful. Um, so that was a big part of it. So my career has been a complete blend of art and science. Um, I started my career at a creative agency and I learned the, imag the magical dance between imagery and words and how to place a photograph and how to uh, position something beautifully. And I appreciated that art. And then I moved quickly um, to, uh, to what is now known as Experian North America, but at the time was direct marketing technology, where I learned the science of marketing, so direct response. So I had that rooting early in my career, and I, I embraced it. And I was at dinner recently with um, my CEO, Alex, who's here, who we've worked together three times now. Um, we had dinner recently in Chicago, and we had the conversation about, are you left-handed or right-handed? And it was the first time, magically, um, that I realized I'm ambidextrous, that I actually had to have that conversation, thinking about how I use my left hand and my right hand. So everything I do that requires power, I do right-handed. I throw a ball, I hit the tennis racket, I swing a golf club. Everything that requires precision, I do left-handed. So I write, I eat, I throw a dart, I play pool, I tie my shoe left-handed, which by the way is really hard when you have two right-handed children. You have to teach them how to tie their shoe facing them because they don't understand why you're tying your shoe that way if they're right-handed. Um, so I realized that I have this left and right-handed art and science brain going on. Um, and to me, it echoed that accuracy, power, precision, art, and science. So after I established this amazing foundation of art and science, I moved to the brand side, and I've never moved back. I went to work for, in Columbus, Ohio at Limited Two, and I launched their direct-to-consumer business, and I've since held many positions in companies that are amazing that Scott mentioned and I won't go back into. Um, I'm the youngest of four girls. I grew up in a small town in northern Illinois um, in the cornfields. I had a paper out at the age of nine. So I've been working literally since I've been nine years old. So I attribute my pursuit of a, of a career in fashion to being the youngest of four girls and wearing hand-me-downs my entire life. But I, but I contribute my success to the art and science, to the balance, to the ability to navigate both hemispheres of my brain, to move swimmingly through the left and right hemispheres. And swimmingly is an adjective that I use um, often because I grew up as a competitive swimmer. So as a marketer and as a brand builder, I also believe in the, the teachings of swimming, which is don't look at the competition. The second you look at the competition, do we have any swimmers in the audience, by the way? Okay, so your coach told you, do not look at the competition. The second you look at the competition, you just took seconds off your time, or a millisecond off your time, and that's the difference between touching first or second or third. So I take that into my work every day. I chase the wall every day. I don't get too caught up in what the competition is doing. I work on being more of who we are. So I use these skills of art and science every day, and I attribute it to what we're all here trying to figure out, right? Art and science, brand and business, 
content and commerce, substance and style. All of those things apply. So speaking of substance and style, I'm going to talk quickly about Kidbox. Kidbox launched in beta in the spring of 2016, so we just celebrated our one-year anniversary. It is retail reinvented. We're at the center of this transformation that's happening with um, box curated boxes of style happening in retail, the box service explosion, if you will. And we're providing truly personalized and a highly engaging way for parents and children to shop together for, ch for kids' clothing. And by the way, children are constantly growing, and they're messy little creatures, so they need new clothing all the time. So that helps our business model. And we're also leveraging proprietary algorithms, data science, machine learning, to deliver a perfectly curated box for children ages newborn to 14. Amazing brands. Um, I, I, as a marketer, I wanted to make sure I included this slide. So as a marketer or not, as a leader, you need to always be laser focused on your pillars of differentiation. What is it about you as a company, a business, a brand that makes you phenomenally unique, distinguished? And for Kidbox, we are offering premier brands. So we carry brands like Diesel, Roxy, Kenzie, Jessica Simpson, Lucky, Adidas, Puma. Um, and we're offering them at amazing prices. So if a customer keeps a box of six to seven items, it costs them $98. That averages $14 to $16 per item. Our third brand pillar is, so the first two pillars create that price value equation, right? I'm getting amazing brands at a good price. The third pillar is threefold and it's more emotional. It's time, it's convenience for the mom in a time-starved universe when moms are busier than ever. It is fun for the child. So even in this day of this, kids still love getting stuff in the mail. They love having things addressed to them. They love the tactile nature of it. And it's time together for both of them. Also in a time where they are looking for the, the tiniest sliver of time to spend together. And we have a social mission at our core. So for every box kept, we clothe a child in need through our relationship. So those are our brand pillars. Um, this is a really powerful thing. So this is just a quick snapshot of how we route our customer back into my account. So if they say that they're keeping their box, they, um, we route them into this experience, which allows them to sit with their child and talk about the charity that they would like us to, to allocate um, the clothing to. So this is a, this, these children in need are used to wearing gently worn, hand-me-down, or donated clothing. These are brand new clothes with the tags still on them. It is life changing for these children. So it could be children in the military families, children in foster homes, children who have just lost their house and all of their belongings due to a flood, um, children whose parents are incarcerated. And what we're hearing back from our customers is that they are starting the conversation with their children about the importance of giving back earlier in their child's life than they ever would have otherwise because of the kid box shopping experience. So we find that to be super powerful and that's what gets me up every morning. And this is just a quick moment. Um, one, of the, one of the girls wrote to, back to us, I love the new clothes because I like to look pretty when I go to school. So it's a universal truth. So culture. I was drawn to this opportunity and I spoke earlier about building a company culture from the ground up. So I believe that organizational charts don't exist to depict how communication flows. I actually believe that every single individual and every single organization should be able to talk to any other individual in the organization, regardless of rank, regardless of file. So I tell my team, you better be comfortable with me talking to your direct reports and their direct reports because that's what's going to happen and that's the culture that we're building. That's free-flowing information. I'm only going to be good at my job if every single person in the organization feels that they can approach me. And so I work really hard at being approachable. And I actually made a joke recently. Somebody asked me in a, in a speaking engagement, what, what, what do you think makes a relevant CEO? And I said, wow, that's a really good question. I said, well, we're a really small company right now, and it's my first true CEO gig. But I look everybody in the eye. I say hello. I ask them how their weekend was. I ask them how their family's doing. I like to know the members of their family, their names. And I hope that that's always the case. And then I paused, and then I said, and I'm always going to use the same restroom. <laughs> that's like a thing with CEOs. Like, the minute the CEO has their own, like, you know, separate restroom, that to me says there's a problem. So I will always be using the same restroom. And you can laugh, 
because I laughed when I said it, and then I told the press not to write that down when I said it. Um, so, so culture, um, we're branded at every touch point at Kidbox. So you can imagine, we think of our, we think of ourselves, we go to work every day with childlike wonder because we're focused on children and parents. So um, we use our brand internally and externally. So our reports, for example, like our revenue report, is called growth spurt. Our barometer of success is a growth chart. We talk about crawl, walk, run strategy. So we actually use this language in our work um, to make sure that our brand is resonating internally. And we certainly resonate it externally. So what have I learned? Um, I'm going to share some five points of wisdom with you, and I hope it's helpful. Pay attention to the moments. I shared my leather jacket with you. I shared my spark moment. It was my defining moment as a consumer, but it heavily influenced my career and where I was headed, even though the, there were naysayers early in my career. It's debatable what's going on right now with this retail apocalypse. Um, I don't necessarily agree with a lot that's been stated, but there is no doubt that there's been seismic shifts and that the landscape has changed. So they're no longer relevant are the Tuesday morning sales meetings where everybody marches in and talks about what happened last week and hopes to create solutions to impact next week. That's looking through the rearview mirror. Um, I would argue that retail has spent too much time looking through the rearview mirror and not enough time looking through the windshield. The moments are through the windshield. The rearview mirror is in the past. It's over. It's kind of like staring at the competition. You'll lose time. Um, career karma. I'm a true believer in taking time to mentor others and to continue to be mentored as, as a person and as a professional. Be curious and be relentless and give back. Find your mentors, find your mentees. There's amazing energy in this industry and it gives back in ways that will surprise you. Um, beyond your wildest imagination, I know it has for me. Um, giving feels good. So I work in a business doing good, helping children in need. Me and my entire team come to work every day with an extra skip in our step. And I think doing good and being good and being socially responsible as brands, as businesses, is going to become more and more paramount and more and more table stakes, especially with the rise of the millennial and the Generation Z consumer. So figure out what that means for you. I'm not being preachy here. I'm just sharing my inspiration. Um, witnessing the giving, the extraordinary experience I had a couple weeks ago when I went out to Children of Promise in, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, it's a place that I liken to like a YMCA where children who either one or both of their parents are incarcerated go after school to do sports activities, receive tutoring, receive counseling, and receive camaraderie with other children who are going through the same thing was life-changing for me. We had just delivered hundreds of items of brand new clothing, and I just had to go see it for myself. And I, I walked out, and my life was changed forever. And not that I haven't been in that situation before and been an observant of that, but being part of it as a business echoed strongly with me and continues to resonate. So good is the new cool. Four, talent is everything. Hire, I like to say I hire happy and humble. I hire Tiggers, not Eeyores. If you're interviewing somebody when they're supposed to be on their game and you're sensing that glass is half empty, guess how they're going to show up at work? The glass is going to be empty. <laughs> so, so hire Tiggers, not Eeyores. And, um, you know, there's amazing talent out there. We, we are in a gifted industry. So move on to the next and hire the Tigger. And as a leader, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and let them do their jobs. It's been a huge part of my success. We learn as much from those we don't want to emulate as those that we do want to emulate. But if you are working with, for someone that you don't want to emulate, your clock is probably ticking. So open your mind. Talent is everything, and you're talented. And as leaders, it's our responsibility to manage and inspire our talent, especially in this frontier of retail. So women and men, number five, and I'll close shortly, we have work to do. Women comprise less than 7% of CEOs at Fortune 1000 companies. 
I'm very happy to hear that 43% of our speakers at Grow Commerce are women. I was the first one to start clapping and give you applause. But out of 10,000 C-level executives, only 18% are women. However, we make up 50% of the workforce and we drive 70 to 80% of all consumer purchasing. So part of me becoming a CEO, even though I really didn't think of myself as a CEO in my entire career, I always thought of myself as a strong number two. That's where it's going to end. Good number two. Got your back. And then some wise person told me, it's actually easier to be number one if you know how to hire strong number twos. <laughs> so that was an epiphany for me. But honestly, as personally, I still didn't see myself that way. And then I started getting educated on these statistics. And then I heard people telling me I was ready. I was ready to be CEO. I was ready to be president. And then I felt it was my duty. So any mistake I've made um, has been about not speaking my mind about a decision that was being made that I knew was not being made correctly and I didn't speak my mind, I didn't fall on my sword. And a lot of that goes back, and I'll be honest, to being a woman in business. But I'm over that. I'm not going to look back and say, I didn't speak up, I didn't speak my mind, I didn't fall on my sword. And I encourage you all, men and women, to do the same. Um, I had to be brave, so women, you be brave too. I got your back. Um, the exciting news is that more women are graduating from college and starting companies and pursuing careers in higher education than ever. I wanted to share something with you. Um, this is called Project Aspire. This is a culture moment for me. And Alan and Scott, I hope it's okay if I go a little bit over time. Um, so this is something I've learned to do as a leader. Um, I've done it, I think this is my fourth time as a leader. I did it within my department, I did it within my division, and now I'm doing it for the entire company. And what I asked is, when we define our culture, let's make it a team project. I don't want to dictate what the culture is. So I asked every team member to come to a meeting with a list of five to six adjectives on how they would like to be described. So if I'm standing at this podium and I'm getting ready to present you with an award, what words am I using to describe you? How do you want to show up? How do you want to be known? And so everyone comes to the table, and they have five to six adjectives, and we put them all up on the, on the easel, post-it notes, and there's 35 to 40 adjectives up there. And then I ask the team, cull it down to five to six on how you want to be defined as a team. So everybody is invested. Everybody believes in these adjectives. Everybody thinks about the difference between fun and happy. You, you wouldn't believe the debates that go on between fun and happy or passionate or strategic or innovative. It's fascinating. This is where my Kidbox team landed. My other teams have landed in different places. And then I've created iconology with help of a graphic designer to reinforce it. So we will have awards and recognition around somebody who acted smart, acted positive, acted customer centric today. And I highly encourage you. It's, it's the most amazing equalizer of culture because you can use it as a tool of feedback. Everyone signed off on it, right? We all culled these ad adjectives down together. So when I pull somebody aside after a meeting and I say, you weren't really a team player in that meeting, they signed off on being a team player. And it provides you with this amazing lens through which to give feedback, to make people feel safe, to give them guardrails. And it's been hugely successful in my career, and I'm, I just wanted to share it with you because I, I think it can be successful and helpful to others as well. So very quickly, um, I'm going to play. We, as I said, we're branded at every touch point. So um, we have actually organized a children's board of directors, a kid's board of directors, before we're organizing an adult seasoned executive board of directors. So next week on the 26th, I have uh, about 10 to 12 kids coming in ages 7 to 14 from all over the country um, to be our board of directors. And they are going to help inform how we grow this business, what we focus on, but more importantly, how we create a movement among children to help children become citizens of the world and understand the importance of giving earlier in their life than they would have perhaps otherwise. So we ask these children to submit videos as part of their um, nominate, as part of our um, Culling the Talent. And I wanted to share this video of Danica. Hi, my name's Danica. 
I'm eight years old and I was a preemie. I lived in the NICU for two weeks. After I got out of the hospital, my family decided they want to help other NICU families. Little Warrior Princesses give gift cards to NICU families. All the families we help are in the Kansas City area. What things have you done in the community? I'm doing a lemonade stand, doing a parade, and doing a run that's about a mile. And why have we done those things? So we could help other Nikki families. How can young people change the world? By getting involved with a charity to help other people. I love helping the community and I love helping babies. I wanna help babies because they are the future. If we can make all the babies healthy, then it would make the world a better place. Can you believe I used to be a NICU baby? Look at me now. I am a little warrior princess. Thank you for watching my video. Give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks for watching. So that was just one example that I wanted to share and she'll be joining us next week in New York and it's just amazing. I mean that kids are saying babies are the future, right? It's like we talk about children being the future, they talk about babies being the future. So um, I wanted to close with, um, oh and this is the t-shirt that they're going to be wearing. So we designed, <laughs> this is our board of directors t-shirt and our hashtag is start small um, and we did little tuxedo t-shirts. So my wish for you. Um, and this industry that's given me such gifts and relationships and professional opportunities and constant learning um, and the, is that we will all leverage the left and right side of our brains and navigate both, both hemispheres um, of art and science. So if you're an artist, embrace your inner science scientist and if you're a uh, scientist, embrace your inner artist. Um, because the magic happens when we strike right down the middle of art and science, brand and business, substance and style. And so my wish for you and all of us is that we will strike down the middle as an industry because that's where the magic happens. So thank you very much. Thank you.